presentation, and then she'll take questions. And I dare you to stump her. Because <laughs> I haven't seen her before. It's happened. Oh, oh, that's that's okay. <laughs> so enjoy and thank you all for coming and happy gardening maybe we'll get a little more rain to help so we won't have to water quite so much um, but so far so good except for those groundhogs <laughs> I'm just going to leave you with that thought thanks so much for coming Thanks, everyone. Uh, yeah, so I'm Emily Basden. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I am the Seed Center Director at Wild Seed Project. Um, my background is really in entomology and wildlife conservation, but as you'll find out in this presentation, um, if I want to conserve, conserve insects and wildlife, I need plants to do that. Um, and that's how I ended up in this world. Um, so today I'm going to talk about no mo may now what which is really just how and why we want to build biodiverse yards um, and biodiverse spaces uh, and a little bit about the history of no mo may and where we can go from there um, before i get started i just want to acknowledge the land and knowledge that we're talking about here um, and that wild seed project um, likes to acknowledge at all of our our talks and walks um, just know that Wild Seed Project is located on ancestral Wabanaki territory, now called Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn, the Abenaki, the Houlton Band of Maliseet Indians, the Mi'kmaq Nation, the Penobscot Nation, and the Passamaquoddy Tribe. We support their continued work for justice, self-determination, and decolonization. The work of Wild Seed Project is necessary precisely because of the ongoing violence of settler colonialism the exploitative practices of European colonizers, which continue to this day, are directly responsible for the displacement of the native plants that form the foundation of local food webs, which I'll talk a lot about towards the end of this uh, talk. Um, we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to build and rebuild reciprocal relationships with people, plants, fungi, soil, water, and air? Reestablishing resilient ecosystems in which all forms of life can thrive is one piece of deconstructing a colonial legacy. As we do our work at Wild Seed Project, though, we're clear this knowledge and information didn't start, nor should it end with us. The resources that we have here are gathered from many teachers, both human and quite often non-human, uh, and we encourage you to learn much more about the historical and present day relationships to the indigenous communities, to the places that you live. Um, if you take a look at this map, uh, try to remember this because I'm gonna recall it a little bit later in the talk, um, and just think about how the, the borders are much different than our current political borders. Um, and then think a little bit about what that means for animals and plants and their ability to move and their ability to migrate and do things like that. So just keep that in mind um, throughout this talk when I get into the, the big plant section. But that kind of gets me into the start here. And there's a bunch of questions that we really should be asking ourselves. And, and the first one really is, you know, why should we be caring and considering uh, fostering habitat that supports life? Um, and it really comes down to this, this massive biodiversity loss that we're seeing. And that is directly connected to the way we use our land, the way we manage it, the way we, we utilize it. Um, and one of the best ways that we can really get an idea of what's going on globally um, at home is to look at indicator species. And one of the best indicator species that I like to talk about are birds. Um, we know that bird populations are dropping critically. Uh, I'm going to start off with some, some depressing facts, and then I'm going to talk about some really great ways that we can help uh, these animals. But we've got 50% fewer songbirds than we did in just 50 years. Um, so there's about 70 species that are on tipping point. That means they're about to become endangered. Uh, even really what used to be really popular populous species are, are disappearing rapidly. Things like um, red-winged blackbirds. Um, I'm a big birder. I lead bird tours and things like that. Uh, they used to be a really annoying bird that like you couldn't hear other birds in the morning. Uh, and now they're just not <laughs> anymore. And that's just really telling just in my lifetime of birding. Um, and it, it, the stats 
fill that in. Um, the North American Bird Conservation Initiative comes out with a state of the bird report uh, every couple of years and they compile a whole bunch of data from a whole bunch of um, different research very historical. This is why birds are really useful is that there's a lot of really historical data on their populations so it can really get us a good idea of, of what's happening and what trends are happening. And on top of that, because so many birds are migratory and they require very specific habitats to nest and raise their young, they're really, really good indicators for what's going on globally for biodiversity and for habitats on, as a whole. Um, so we can look at some of these numbers and, and get a good idea of what's going on. Not just birds, though. Uh, I have to talk insects because that's my, my big thing. Uh, insects are, are really seeing some st staggering population losses, and it's really quite concerning. So on average, studies are seeing there's about a 45% um, decrease in insects in just the last 40 years. Um, some studies say it's more, it looks like it's closer to 75% losses, which is really scary and staggering. We know insects pollinate like 75% of our global crops, um, which is about a $600 billion industry, but that's just like for us, much more importantly, um, they're necessary for ecosystem stability and functioning and food webs. Um, and the two really big driving causes that all these studies are seeing um, for this loss of insects are climate change, which is a little bit more complicated to track, and habitat loss. Mm -hmm. Habitat loss is really the big, big thing. Um, we're seeing, oh, thank you. <laughs> we're seeing over 40% of species that are really threatened with extinction. And the monarch, of course, is a really great example um, that's kind of become the big poster child. Uh, and just like with birds, sometimes insects that used to be super populous are disappearing. I, I'm just as, in my lifetime, I used to see tons and tons and tons of monarchs. And last year, I saw maybe five. Um, and that's, that's quite extreme for somebody who's been looking at bugs my whole life. Uh, it's just things to really consider. Um, and a lot of this comes down to that habitat loss. We, we know biodiversity really can't be sustained on just our preserved lands. Um, about 60% of the U.S. is privately owned, and the, in Maine that's closer to 90%. Um, and a lot of those viable habitats have been mismanaged not managed, um, have been fragmented quite significantly, been degraded by all sorts of introduced plants that limit the biodiversity in an area, um, and they just aren't able to engage in normal ecosystem services and functioning. Um, and it's led to a lot of our land being more dependent on infrastructure than the ecosystem functioning as it is, and I'll talk about that a little bit later too. Um, and just if you think about some of these preserves, if you take these, these populations and you shrink them down into just preserves, they end up being really vulnerable to localized extinction. So just one disease or one storm or one event can go through and completely extinct everything in an area or a species in that area. Um, and without being able to, if, if we think about trying to connect some of those more vulnerable, smaller areas and habitats, um, it can kind of make them more continuous uh, and larger with some of that 90% pri privately owned land. Um, we can really make a big change, but it really is gonna come down to rethinking some of our landscaping um, priorities. Um, historically, a lot of our landscaping priorities focus on decorative value. Um, but if we wanna make a change and we wanna help some of that biodiversity and some of those species come back, we need to think about how to, how to balance some of that decorative value uh, in our landscapes with some other things. And that brings up a whole bunch of questions. The big question is, well, what, what does wildlife even need to survive and thrive? Um, and they need a lot of the same things we do. If you're familiar with like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, they need water, shelter, food, places to raise their young, um, healthy land practices. Uh, if you're familiar with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the one thing that I think of that's missing on this is, is the concept of community. You see that come up a lot. But the fun thing about the wildlife community is if you get all of that stuff, it builds that community, it builds interacting relationships and interconnectedness, and it creates such balance that it, it really is a thriving community of different species. So it is there, it's just not written there. So in order to, to get all those things, all those points, um, we can think about how we manage our landscapes and what we plant. So many of those things can be covered in that. 
So I'm going to cover a few what we call simple action steps. The two that major ones that I'm going to talk about are just some simple changes in our maintenance strategies, which goes along with the no mow may concept. Um, and then planting, what we can plant to really provide the best um, bottom-up uh, cascades for, for higher biodiversity. And then I'll, I'll end on a little bit of how to get creative and collaborate and things like that. But the, the top two are our major things we're going to focus on today. Um, and the first one is going to be these maintenance strategies. And that really brings me to no mo may. <laughs> uh, really catchy phrase. Uh, raise your hand if you did no mo may this year. Cool, cool, a few, yeah, yeah. So what, what is Nomo May? No, Nomo May was started by a group in the UK in about 2019, and it, it caught on board a year later in the US, and people started not mowing their lawns for May. Um, big difference with the UK is that their lawns are filled with a lot of native species already. Mm -hmm. So when they don't mow, um, it brings up a bunch of habitat creating plants. Um, but in the US, it totally depends on where you are. Um, though I will say it's better than mowing for all of May, right? Um, so, so it's good you're not using as many fossil fuels, and I'll talk about that in a second, the real issue with lawns. But like I said, if, if you're lucky, if you already have cool biodiversity and cool species in your area um, and supportive plants, you might see some beneficial things like these bluets that showed up in my yard or these violets and strawberries and ferns and little saplings and my dog absolutely loves them all in my yard. <laughs> but if you don't already have this sort of uh, species dynamics in your seed bank, you're gonna end up with something a little bit more like this, which is probably what you're seeing a lot. Dandelions, clovers, grasses that are all non-native. Um, this isn't necessarily bad, uh, but it's not nearly as supportive. Um, but if you think about it, that was a whole month of not using lawn fossil fuels, mm -hmm. um, allowing roots to get a little bit lower. It does provide a little bit of nectar sources for our generalist bees and things like that. Um, I'll get into pollinators in a little bit. But it really comes down to the issue of lawns, right? Even, even this lawn, the big issue is that lawns require a lot of work and they're, they're really quite unhealthy. Um, millions of tons of fertilizer, millions of pounds of pesticides, huge amounts of landfill space. Um, this 10,000 square foot turf requires 10,000 square feet or 10,000 gallons of water. The average yard in America is about a quarter acre, um, is, is about a half acre. 10,000 square feet is about a quarter acre. So that means the average homeowner is using about 20,000 gallons of water each summer for just one monoculture species. Um, turf grass is now considered the number one irrigated crop in the United States. Mm. Nice. And that's feeding no one. <laughs> Maybe those groundhogs, I don't know. Um, we know turf grass just doesn't support life. Um, and not only that, is the machines used to manage those lands are higher carbon producers than automobiles. There's these like huge amounts of inputs. They're using oil and gas a lot of the time, and they're running for large amounts of time and needing to be restarted over and over again, and it creates quite a lot of um, hydrocarbon pressure. So then we can ask ourselves, we've got all this information now, do, do I even really need a lawn? Maybe, maybe there's some spaces that, that you want to, your dog won't go anywhere else or your kid needs a soccer field or something but I'd ask you if there's other green spaces town green spaces that are welcome for everyone to be able to use for for those lawn cases and if you really feel like you still need a lawn you can ask yourself really how much do you need do you need this much where your trees need bags to keep themselves watered or can you share some of that space with plants? And I would argue that that would create a much more dynamic um, life, a much more interesting life. I was listening to, I don't know, it was like a hidden brain or something, and it was saying the, the biggest thing that really happy people have is a sense of awe in their lives. Mm. And I realized it like was a light bulb moment for me that uh, they were interviewing all these people who like travel all over the world to get this sense of awe, and I was like, you don't, need, you don't need that. You don't need that if you have dynamic spaces and really interesting things and enough biodiversity to have awe in your everyday life. 
And I'll give some cool examples from my yard too in a little bit. But if you think about sharing that space and limiting the amount of lawn, there's a lot we can do. Um, and if you're into that, we can talk about how to ditch your lawn. Uh, there's a lot of ways you can go about doing it. Some is just continuing the no mow may. Learn what's in your seed bank. Keep what came up that you like. Rip out other things. You can start planting little amounts. So dig up small parts and plant and do this um, cardboard around the edge so that it doesn't compete so much with the lawn. Uh, you can solarize or smother, so using clear or black plastic over the grass to kill that takes about six months to a year. Um, or you can sheet mulch, which involves laying cardboard down and about six inches of aged bark mulch or wood chips um, to kill that grass. And that also takes about six months to a year, and then you can plant right into that. So there's a lot of ways to go about doing that. Uh, sometimes I just plant stuff in my lawn and hope it goes, and sometimes it works. Um, so the next big management change that we can do is really just stopping using harmful pesticides and herbicides. We know they hurt insects, plants, birds, ourselves. Um, we know this. Even organic pesticides, it's in the name. Pesticides kill pests. They are going to kill insects. They are going to harm them. Um, it's just part of it. Uh, instead, we can think about what I was saying before. If we remember that concept of community, if we build all of the things that wildlife needs, we have a structured community that creates balance. So yes, some of your plants will be eaten, but they won't be killed because the predators and the parasitoids and the things like that will also be in that community. And it will create enough balance that you don't have issues with pests. You don't have issues with anything. You just have maybe a little bit of feeding on your plants, which adds to that sense of awe. When I see a plant that's fed on, I get excited and I look for the creature that's feeding on it. And then I can find something really amazing happening in my yard. So the next management technique that you can use is, is, is providing, remember those, those concepts of shelter and nesting space. Um, you can do that through just the way you manage the plants in your yard. Um, so it's like so much of the way that we manage our plants really, really provides that shelter. Um, and one of those big ways we can do that is just the leave the leaves. I'm sure everybody's heard of this concept before. Um, and I can't suggest it enough. First of all, the leaves, if you have enough of them, will also help kill your grass. <laughs> But it also builds up the, the living soil bank. Um, and there are countless species that require leaf litter to survive. They need it to survive a winter. Um, all of our salamanders, uh, many, many of our insects, insects all over winter, either as an egg, a larva, a pupa, or an adult. And so many of them require a good amount of leaf litter to do that. Bumblebees are a really great example. They overwinter underground and they need a good insulating leaf litter to survive. And our bumblebees are rapidly disappearing. We have one at least extinct species in the state um, and several that are probably endangered. Um, and they insulate your plant roots. It provides like natural compost. I keep all of my leaves. If, if you find like your leaves are all blowing to one space and you don't like it there, you can move them around. But I encourage you to not chip them and to just leave them um, in a spot that works for you to provide space for these animals. Um, if you like things like luna moths or polyphemus moths, those really beautiful charismatic moth species, you need to leave the leaves for them to survive. The next thing you can do is just leave standing vegetation. It adds winter structure to a garden. Um, it, if you keep the seed heads, it allows both the plant to reseed and spread and provides food for seed eating wildlife over the winter. It provides shelter. It provides wind breaks. It's really quite attractive a lot of the time. Um, Fun quick story, I, I don't do any cutbacks in my yard. And this year, for the first time, I had a bunch of milkweed that stayed up all year. And I got to watch a female Baltimore Oriole stripping. If you know of milkweed, it's really fibrous. And she was stripping long strings off of the milkweed mm -hmm. for so long. Clearly, if you're familiar with Baltimore Oriole nests, oh they're these God. perfect woven hanging nests. Oh and she was so obvious that what she was doing was getting string for her nest. And it was so special to, that she saw my yard, she saw my plants, and she said, that's the spot. 
I'm getting my nest stuff. So it's real, it really happens. And I've only been in my yard for just about five years now. So it, it doesn't take long to, to do this and make these changes. And she wasn't there five years ago. <laughs> Uh, the next thing you can do with cutbacks is if, if you have to do some cutbacks, do it with stem nesting bees in mind. Um, quick note on bees. Honeybees are not native. We all often think of save the bees and the, the picture is always the honeybee, right? That's, that's the European honeybee. Uh, she's important for, for agriculture and things like that, but she's a livestock species. They, they don't require us. Um, they, well, they do require us. They don't they're not part of our ecosystem. Um, they're not doing the bulk of our ecosystem services. Our native bees are doing that. And Maine is home to at least 270 species of native bee. 270 species, and many of them are these teeny tiny little bees, and they're doing the bulk of our ecosystem pollinating, um, as are many flies. Um, many butterflies, many beetles. There are so many species outside of the honeybee that are doing really the bulk of our pollinating. Um, and as far as our, our bees, most of them are what are called solitary bees. So one bee raises her hive on her own, unlike the, the honeybee that has tens of thousands of bees working together to, to raise their hive. Um, and many of them spend their uh, life cycle, their larval cycle, just in the stem of a bee. Things like this small carpenter bee, a, a stem of a plant. Um, that was one that was uh, dug out from a common elderberry plant. Um, and if you're thinking about cutbacks um, and hollow plants, you want to try to leave your stems between 8 and 24 inches high. Uh, Heather Holm is a professor and researcher out of the Midwest, um, and she has done really extensive research on what types of uh, on stem nesting bees and what they need. And they need those hollow stems. Um, and naturally, if you just leave your plants up, up, enough of them break throughout the winter to do their thing. Um, but if you need to do cutbacks, leave them between 8 and 24 inches. Uh, those bees are able to come in in the spring and lay their eggs in the the holes of the stems, um, provision them with pollen and nectar, and then raise up their young. And they pupate and they go through the whole winter in that stem and then emerge again in the spring um, and start the whole thing over again with, with new broken stems. So that's, that's the first one. But more common than our stem nesting bees are our ground nesting bees. Um, of that 270 native bees, so many of them are ground nesting. And just a quick note on wasps. Everybody hates wasps. I love wasps. Also, everybody just thinks of yellow jackets. And guess what? There's like over a thousand species of wasp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're doing all sorts of things. And they are the number one pest control on the planet. So if, if we want to have to stop using those pesticides and have things create balance, we need wasps. We need wasps to be doing that. Um, wasps like this great golden digger wasp, she's beautiful. The adult is a pollinator, a really important pollinator. You can see her on the swamp milkweed there. Um, and she will sting her prey, just a grasshopper, and she'll dig a hole and she'll lay her egg with it and her larvae are predators and will eat that grasshopper that would be causing a lot of plant damage otherwise. I took a picture of that hole. That, that wasp dug that hole and I watched her and got very, very close to her. She was not mad at me at all, no threat or anything. It would take quite a lot to get stung by something like that. So there's very few that are actually all that ornery. Um, and then so many of our bees, like our, this aster mining bee, uh, requires bare ground. Um, a nice note, pretty much all of us have a spot in our yard that nothing will grow, right? Mm. And there's always something we want to do to cover that space. But instead, we can look at that as habitat and wait for bees to come. I have lots and lots of ground nesting bees in my yard, and they're so fun to watch. The andrinas, they're, they're this uh, genus of bee, uh, are one of the first ones to emerge. And you'll see them flying and hovering around low, low to the ground. Um, they're pollinating a lot of our spring ephemerals, a lot of our early pollinated plants, and a lot of our trees, our maples, our pussy willows, things like that. Um, so just really important to just provide some bare ground and, and be okay with it. 
Um, the next thing you can do is just leaving sticks and logs. Um, you can make them attractive and stack them, or you can just do what I do and leave a big pile. And it doesn't look great, but the wrens really like nesting in it. So I'm like, all right, guys, go for it. And it provides a place for decomposers. Um, remember, decomposers are on another really important part of our food webs and a part of what keeps balance in our, our ecosystems. And providing for the right ones can do a lot of good. And then one of my favorite things to talk about is snag trees. Uh, snag tree is a really great ecological term. It just means a dead tree. Um, but it provides a huge amount of shelter and nesting areas for wildlife. Um, if you have a tree that died on your property, and it's like mine, like my maple on the far side, that's at risk of falling on your house, arborists, they'll look at you like you're a little crazy, will leave a big <laughs> trunk if you ask them to. Um, and they did. And I was really sad that we had to cut it down, but it was dying. And I wanted to leave as much as possible. And they, they heard me. They did it. Um, and I have fall oyster mushrooms that grow on that tree every year. And my uh, forager friends are really jealous of me. Mm -hmm. um, and I have, uh, what are they called, uh, flying squirrels nesting in the hole there that like to feed on my bird feeders at night. And I was so sad about cutting it down and losing all that shade, but it opened up enough room for bluebirds. And now I have bluebirds um, that come and chill on the top of that, that's, that perch, and it's a really great perch for them. Um, beaches are another one that end up really hollow, and you get things like uh, these screech owls. This one, my mom's been watching these beech trees in Connecticut for forever, and every year they get screech owls. And this year they had babies. <laughs> So providing those nesting areas and holes can be very exciting and sometimes you get very, very cute babies. <laughs> so that's management. Now if you're not sick of me, we can uh, talk about plants uh, and how, how we can really use plants to also provide the food and the shelter and the nesting space. Um, thinking about your canopy, your understory, and your ground layer is a really important and useful tool when you're thinking about how to plant and what to do. It can get complicated because there's like 15,000 plants you could put in. And, but thinking about it in terms of habitat and in terms of having an, a canopy and an understory and a ground cover layer can be really helpful. Um, but before we get into what to plant, Let's, let's talk about what, what actually is a native plant, because you can look up all sorts of definitions online, and they're all, all different. Um, and the definition I like to use is just an indigenous plant that occurs naturally in a particular region, ecosystem, habitat, and it has co-evolved with the, the region's flora and fauna and fungi and microorganisms, and it fills, fills a niche, basically. Uh, usually, those are plants that have grown prior to European colonization, but that brings into question who decides what native, what's native, right? Think back to that map that, that I showed you in the very beginning. A lot of things when you look at native plant maps are based on our borders, right? It's like this plant is in Maine, but not in New Hampshire and not in Canada. <laughs> but then you look at it, the, these older maps, those borders are fake, right? So a lot of our plants, none of our plants, I should say, absolutely none of our plants <laughs> care about borders. <laughs> like, absolutely. None of our animals care about borders. So it's really important to think about who decides what's native and to think about the concept that humans are part of the ecosystem and have been moving plants for millennia. Since time immemorial, people have been moving plants around. Um, so we really need to, to take that in co into consideration. I don't have an answer to that, but food for thought. But why are native plants so important? You know, it's a complex definition, but we know they're super important. Well, they're important for countless reasons. I spoke before about um, how, how a lot of our managed systems are now dependent on infrastructure for, for a lot of things that used to be ecosystem services. So native plants can do things like clean water, provide erosion control, sequester carbon, um, absorb water. So we had so much rain last year. And a lot of the reasons that we had such issues is because of impervious surfaces. Um, they, a lot of them can actually compete with, nat native, uh, with invasive plants. The big thing that I'm focused on is providing habitat. Um, 
and supporting pollinators. And that all comes down to the fact that native plants are really the foundation of our food webs. Um, if we want things like blueberries and fruits, we need to provide the pollinators and the plants. Um, there's no seed set without a pollinator, right? If we want birds, if we want wildlife, we need to have insects for those. And the only thing insects tend to eat, at least herbivorous insects, eat are native plants. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But before I get there, let's talk about native fruiting trees and shrubs. We know they're really great. Um, for a lot of birds, especially for frugivores. Um, but if you notice there, the nutritional difference between native and non-native plants is extreme. Not only that, they're phenologically timed to a lot of the times these birds actually need these fruits. Um, so, so things like bayberry and viburnum will hold their fruits really late into the year at the time when these birds actually need them. If you have a summer blue, a summer fruiting plant, it's not necessarily going to be as good for frugivores because they should be focusing on, on insects, really. Um, and that really brings me to the fact that, really, most birds need insects to survive. Um, and that's like most birds. 96% <laughs> of our terrestrial birds rear their young on insects. Um, a lot of times that's, that's caterpillars. They serve a really useful um, source and they're a really good indicator that I'm going to use as a great example for things uh, as I talk about specialization. But caterpillars are really important because they're really full of protein and they're really full of fat and they're really full of something called carotenoids. And carotenoids are the things that give birds their bright colors. So those beautiful cardinals are red because of the carotenoids that they're ingesting. Um, the reason we have beautiful scarlet tanagers. And all of that coloration comes down to their success for being able to breed, right? So if we want them to be able to breed and we want them to be successful, they need to have those insects. And baby birds eat so much, so much, um, to raise a clutch of chickadees. Uh, an adult pair needs to find between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars. It's a lot of caterpillars. Uh, robins are reported to eat twice their mass in larva in one day. Worldwide, birds eat about 400 to 500 million metric tons of insects. So many bugs need to be eaten by birds. And birds are really great at representatives, right? I was talking about that before, but they're not the only ones. So many species rely on insects, amphibians, reptiles, bats. About 23% of a black bear's diet is actually insects, and they're, actually, they're pretty uh, useful in times of um, like forest caterpillar outbreaks and things like that. They eat quite a lot. Don't get too mad that I put a rodent up there, right? They do need insects to survive. And we don't like them necessarily, but without them, we don't have any of our predators, right? We lose so many of our really charismatic and important predators. So that brings, that's like a lot of animals, right? That, that require insects. What landscapes can really support that kind of diversity and that kind of abundance? And to answer that, we really have to think about the specialization in the animal kingdom. And specialization is really um, the rule in the animal kingdom. Um, if we want to have tens of thousands of insects available, we need to have the plants that they feed on. Um, and we know plants, plants don't necessarily want to be eaten. Um, they pack themselves full of all sorts of really distasteful chemicals. Um, Yet they are eaten, right? Um, so this is a cherry. Cherry is full of cyanide. Not something we can eat. But they're one of the, the top food plants for insects. Um, because insects are really good at getting around those chemicals. And that comes down to that specialization. Um, they only specialize on a handful of plants each. So about 90% of insects can only eat plants that they um, and develop on that they share an evolutionary history with. So those are those native plants, right? Remember, the definition of, of a native plant means that things have evolved with them. Um, so this is a cool example. This is probably my favorite caterpillar. I don't know, arguable. Um, but this is a Pandora sphinx moth caterpillar. Um, and that insect can only feed on Virginia creeper and our native grape in this area. That's all. So without those, this guy doesn't exist. Um, 
it comes down to that specialization. This juniper hair streak adult can feed on a wide range, this, this adult there, can feed on a really wide range of flowering plants like the fragrant sumac in the picture. But its caterpillar can only feed on junipers and cedars, right? And, and junipers and cedars happen to be full of this, this monoterpene that's super, super toxic to a lot of things, um, including a lot of insects. Uh, this is why we use cedar Cabin, cabinets and stuff, right? They, insects don't tend to feed on them. But this caterpillar has evolved to really only be able to feed on those. And not just that, it's got this incredible camouflage. Like, how would you ever find that? Though birds are surprisingly really good at finding them, um, especially things like kinglets are really good at finding them. Um, and that, that is all because of that millennia of coevolution together. Um, so when we're thinking about what we want to plant, we can think about planting for some of these specialized species, right? Um, and that, that's the concept of the host plant. So you can learn um, what host plants, what plants support what species, and you can plant for those specialized ones. So if you want the snowberry clearwing moth, you want to plant our native honeysuckle or snowberry. Those are kind of the two options for around here for that caterpillar to eat, to, to survive. Um, as far as pollinators, I'll talk about those in a second. So we can focus on the specialized things and, and pick and choose what kind of cool caterpillars we want to attract. Or we can plant for the number, the most amounts. So we can plant for copious caterpillars. And that brings up the concept of the keystone species. Um, so if you're not familiar with the keystone species, if we think about masonry, the keystone for an arch, there's a bunch of stones. The keystone is that top one on the arch. And if you lose that, you lose the whole arch, right? The whole thing falls apart. And you can use this concept in ecology um, with a keystone species. And there are certain species that support the, num the most number of insect herbivores over others. Um, and for caterpillars, that comes down to a lot of our trees, comes down to our oaks, our willows, our cherries, and our poplars. Um, they support hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of um, species of caterpillar. Uh, one of the things that I like to do just as a birder is find a good oak in an area and stare at it for like 20 minutes. And I can find lots of birds, and they are actively foraging on the caterpillars on those trees. Um, one of the nice things about these is that a lot of these species don't have to be huge like an oak. Um, willows, cherries, many of these species can either be cut to stay shrubby or have, have species that are shrubby. Um, so if you don't have a lot of space, you can still plant these keystone species for caterpillars, which is really helpful and, and great. But it's not just herbivores, um, or it's not just leaf feeding herbivores. Uh, pollinators and plants also have a millennia of coevolution and specialized relationships, both to collect pollen and to be pollinated. Uh, I love talking about mountain laurel. That's the, the plant on the end there. You can see that cup-shaped flower. Um, if you look carefully, you can see all the stamens are kind of rolled over into these little red dimples on the plant. That's a pollination technique that this plant has evolved over millennia. Um, those, those Stamens are, and pistons are, are held back, and only a bee with enough weight to release them is going to pollinate it. And it lands on the plant, and they spring, they're spring loaded. They spring over the back of the bee, and these bees tend to be really furry, and they have to pull up out of it, and they get a bunch of pollen stuck to their backs, and then they go to the next flower, and it pollinates it, and over and over again. And it's really spectacular and neat to watch. Um, orchids have all sorts of crazy mechanisms using pheromones, using traps where the bee has to go through the whole flower to be able to get out one end and it thinks it's mating with something but it's just pollinating it. Um, so when we think about pollinating and planting for pollinators, um, we can think about that specialization but we can also think about um, making sure, I always encourage people to make sure they're, they're using lots of different flower shapes. So, so a lot of different species is great, um, but sometimes you end up with just all open, like composite flowers, right? But if we have tubular shaped flowers, if we have funky shaped flowers, it's really cool because a lot of our native bees, remember there's 270 species, many of them have very specific mouth parts um, that, that need different shapes of flowers. Some are really tiny and are only going to go for one shape or another. Um, so just having a really good diversity of, of flower shape is really useful. And there's so much that we're not seeing with flowers, right? They have scents that we don't see. They, 
insects and birds can see in ultraviolet and we cannot. Um, and plants often have really impressive ultraviolet coloration that we don't see. Um, many of them mimic another insect. There's just so many, so much complexity with plants and being able to pollinate. Um, if you look at uh, historically, when, when angiosperms, flowering plants, showed up, pollinators exploded. There were just so many. Before that, the first ones were magnolias, and the, the things that were pollinating them were beetles. And then once more angiosperms started showing up, uh, wasps became bees. So b bees are really just wasps, which maybe that'll make people love wasps a little bit more. Bees are just furry wasps. <laughs> um, and they, they showed up when those flowering plants started showing up and things got really complex. And just like with the caterpillars, we can uh, plant for specialized pollinators. We can plant for particular ones. If you really like ruby-throated hummingbirds, that's our native hummingbird. Um, planting tubular-shaped flowers, red and orange ones, does a lot. Those scarlet bee bombs, the, the trumpet honeysuckle, um, Jewelweed. So jewelweed's an annual that people pull like crazy out of their garden, but it attracts so many hummingbirds. I fully got rid of having hummingbird feeders in my yard. Never again will I have a hummingbird feeder. They're too much work. You have to clean them every couple days. They get yellow jackets. They get ants. They, they're just so much work. And I have so many hummingbirds in my yard, and it's totally because of what I plant. And they're so fearless that it, it works great. Um, and then there's, there's things like this bellflower resin bee that can only feed on, we only have tall bellflower really native in this area. Um, and it's the only time you're going to see that bee. <laughs> and it's a beautiful flower. Um, and then even, even common generalist bees. So the common bumblebee is one of our most generalist species of bee. Can feed on wide ranges of pollen and nectar. Um, but then there's cool plants like this bottle gentian, this closed gentian that protects its, its pollen and nectar source in these closed petals, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the only bees that are really strong enough to get in there and access them are these, these big bumblebees. Um, so the bumblebee can see that plant and say, oh, there's probably still nectar and pollen available in there because I'm the one who can do this. Um, so there's, there's so much you can think about and so much fun that you can have with it for these specialized things. But just like with the oaks and the willows, we can also plant for plentiful pollinators. Um, same thing with the keystone species of the oaks. Our goldenrods and our asters are, are really incredible pollinator species. And a lot of larvae do feed on the leaves as well. Um, everybody wants to save the monarch, right? That's the new poster child of like save the things. Um, and we can plant all the milkweed in the world. And our monarchs still need more than that. If we think about what's blooming, like we know, everybody here knows the life cycle of a monarch, right? It's got to fly from, from us all the way down to Mexico, which means it needs a really strong nectar source to be able to get to Mexico. And what's not blooming in the fall? <laughs> Milkweed. What is blooming in the fall and has incredibly high quality nectar and pollen are our goldenrods and our asters. Um, Super, super important. There was a study done in restoration ecology that showed that bees, native and non-native bees, preferred over, over 77% exclusively fed on native plants. Um, and even they found the honeybees preferred the native plants. Um, and a lot of people think of goldenrods and asters as being kind of thuggish and don't fit in a garden, but that's not true. Um, there are lots of species of both, and they do everything. There's like 30 species of goldenrod in our state or something like that. And there's one that's good for dry shade. There's one good for dry wet. There's one good for containers. There's something good for, for all of your site conditions. You can find a goldenrod and an aster to fit in those places that you have. Um, and there's other that, others that are suitable for much larger, larger spaces, like our Canada goldenrod. <laughs> So with all of this knowledge, all of these maintenance techniques, all of the plantings, we can really support full insect life cycles and then the broader food webs, right? Um, so one of the great examples of, of using all these techniques is the, the, ter the um, Baltimore checker spot butterfly. Gorgeous butterfly. Their caterpillars will only feed on white turtle head. Um, not a super common plant tends to be kind of on wetland margins. Um, and they have a weird life cycle where the, the female will lay the eggs and they'll, they'll feed, 
Um, and then in the fall, the caterpillar drops down into the leaf litter. And the caterpillar overwinters in the leaf litter as a caterpillar, which is why we want to leave those leaves, right? Um, and then in the spring, they grow, they climb back up onto that host plant that they were at the leaf litter near and feed again and pupate and start their life cycle over again. So that's just one example of countless of species that, that need this sort of um, help. So with all of those concepts, we can really balance those aesthetics of a beautiful garden, right, with these ecosystem services, with food webs in mind. Um, but to do that, it, it takes some rethinking, right? It takes, takes getting a little bit creative. Um, it takes kind of shifting our thoughts of what a landscape should look like um, with some of those ecological needs. Um, one of the things I really love to do is create nice me meandering paths. So I've, let, I've planted a lot and I've let a lot of plants grow up and I've created these little paths just by my little electric weed whacker um, that I follow around. Uh, and, and I have one that leads to a picnic table that's surrounded in a little like pine section. Um, so we can, we can kind of build these outdoor spaces that are, are fun and dynamic that we can use. Um, and while we build that, we can think about, remember the, the canopy understory uh, concept, and we can think about really heavy species rich layering. So thinking about, remember, all the different flower shapes, all the different um, bloom times, having a wide range of bloom times, so there's always something blooming. And having that mix of diversity of plants also ensures there's always a showstopper. We're seeing a lot of extreme changes in weather, right? Uh, last year, was crazy it rained and was freezing cold like all year <laughs> um, and if you plant enough mixes if you have things that can handle wet cold they do great and then if a couple years later you have a drought and you have some things that can handle drought um, there's there's always something there's always something providing a lot of benefit so thinking if you have kind of average soil trying to, to add in things that can handle a lot of extreme wide ranges um, and the it'll look you know, the, the wet things on a dry year won't be dead. Like you'll think they're dead, they're just dormant. They, they will come back the next time the conditions are right for them, which is one of the really lovely things about native plants. They're adapted to, especially New England native plants, tend to be pretty adapted to weird climate <laughs> things. And hopefully they can continue to do that as we see things continue to change. Um, but you don't have to have a huge amount of space to do this, right? You can do this in patios, you can do this on fences, window boxes, hell strips. Um, up until about five years ago, I was apartment dwelling and I brought my perennial planters everywhere with me <laughs> from apartment to apartment. And the hummingbirds and things like that came with me. And well, didn't come with me, but they found me pretty quickly, the new ones in my new spaces. Um, so you can really do a lot with a little bit of space. Um, and the more we do it, the more we connect habitats, right? So if everybody in Portland who just has a balcony plants things, we can really connect a lot of space and provide um, stopovers for things like monarchs and things like migratory birds. Um, I'd be uh, yelled at if I didn't bring this up, <laughs> no. Um, you can take things really a step further and um, while you're sourcing your plants, this can, sourcing plants can be really hard, it can be really tricky. Um, there's so many questions about cultivars, about where the plant came from, whether or not the place you bought it from uses pesticides. If it uses systemic pesticides, they're in the plant for up to seven or more years. That's every single part of the plant. That's the seed, that's the pollen. There's so much we don't know. But you can really go further and, and grow seed grown perennials. Um, that way you know where they came from. You know everything about that plant's history. It's probably going to be way more adapted to your climate and your area if it's doing, if it gets successful and grows in your spot. It requires very little cost. It's much cheaper than <laughs> buying plants. Um, and you end up with way more plants than you think you're ever going to need, which is fun because you can get to know people and get to trade and, and be part of a, a fun little community that, that trades plants, which is what I belong to right now. And it's, it's very fun. Um, so if you want to know more about how to grow 
these plants from seed. Uh, check out Wild Seed Project um, if you don't know us already. In the fall, fall is the fall and winter is really the best time to, to grow these plants from seed, which is also, if you're an avid gardener, really fun because it's when you're not doing anything else and you get to plan your garden and, and start actually being in soil in the winter. Um, it's because they've evolved these really hard seed coats um, that, that require winter periods to break them down. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, check us out. There's a lot of um, information on our website, and we do uh, free workshops on how to sow plants. We'll probably do one here in the, the fall or winter. Um, so yeah, if you're into that, check it out. And that just brings me to like connecting. We have to make connections um, both with our habitats and personally. Um, it's really important that we get involved, find local conservation organizations, um, talk to your neighbors. Um, really try to connect these habitats. If you live near one of those little preserves that I was talking about earlier, get to know some of the plants that are in there and some of the species that, that need them and think about planting a couple of those in your yard. Um, and with all of that, we can build really biodiverse habitats that support all of our communities um, and build up real community and real lifestyle changes. Um, and it can make a huge, huge difference. Um, and with that, just thank you so much. Um, if you are interested in Wild Seed Project and joining our membership, there's a bunch of perks. We also have a bunch of really beautiful guides where the art was all done by local artists. They're gorgeous. Um, we have a newest guide called Planting for Climate Resilience that uh, covers a lot of the, the, really, the plants that can handle really extreme conditions, which is becoming more and more important. Um, yeah, so just a couple links if folks are interested in places you can find more information about host plants. So I talked a lot about, you know, all these insects require very specific plants. There are resources where you can learn what's what. So if you really want the Pandora Sphinx and you can't remember that it feeds on Virginia creeper, things like that, there's, there's great resources. Um, the National Wildlife Federation has a, a good um, garden for wildlife uh, page or resource where you can type in your zip code and find a bunch of plants that are there um, and find the, the species that feed on them so you can get a good list of caterpillars, which also helps when you have those plants and you want to ID a caterpillar. If you're like, oh, this thing has been feeding and I have no idea what this is, it's a good way to help track it down. Um, so yeah, I highly encourage you all to check that out um, and think about gardening for habitat. Thanks. I'll, I can take some questions. Emily. Yeah. Hi, Eddie Wood in Scarborough. Are you taking questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, very well done. And, and I'm here primarily, I'm bird based uh, to learn about the insects. Thank you. Um, there's a collapse of insects. Sure we is. We used to go out at night, uh, 30 year property. And in our perennial gardens, we had monarchs at night. We'd go out with a flashlight, and it was remarkable, mm -hmm. the, the quantity. Uh, very much less so now. Uh, I started the anti-pesticide movement because of the lack of insects in 2009. Do you have any thoughts or opinions within your group on why the insects are collapsing? I have personally a lot of thoughts on it. Um, like, yeah, my, my background's entomology and a lot of what I focused on was, was insect loss. Um, and a lot of it really does come down to the way our, our areas are managed. Um, there's a lot of broadcast pesticide use that um, is not being controlled. Um, we're seeing staggering losses in insects and unfortunately one of the, one of the few insects that we're not seeing losses in are um, things like mosquitoes. Uh, and it's making people spray them like crazy. And unfortunately, a lot of the mosquitoes that are, are vector-bearing mosquitoes, ones that can cause disease, aren't native here. Um, and there's a lot of just misconception around mosquitoes where people think they should just fog their whole yard and it's gonna do something about mosquitoes, but it doesn't, it doesn't work. It kills everything else. It kills the predators of mosquitoes. And also mosquitoes really aren't that bad. Um, they're largely pollinators. A lot of people don't realize that the only reason the mosquitoes need blood is just the females need it to, to lay their eggs. So they're not even really utilizing it for themselves. They're utilizing it to have the protein to lay their eggs. Um, mostly they're pollinating. But 
people freak out when they see a bug and they spray like crazy. So I think that's one of the big things. And then habitat loss is a huge one. So if we're mowing everything and we're not providing the overwintering habitat, we're not providing the plants that those insects need to survive, um, Without caterpillars, we lose the wasps and the parasitoids. Um, most wasps are, are parasitoids, so they parasitize things like caterpillars and flies and beetles, and they're the ones creating the number. A lot of people think birds are the things that are, are affecting our, our pest control, but really it's wasps that are the number one pest control on our planet. Um, so they're, the loss of them is really important too. Um, so I think it's compounded things. Um, lights are not helping. Um, we, we know so that things like fireflies, things like um, any, any nocturnal insect is being highly, highly uh, harmed by, by lights. Um, and even just changing to a, a soft light bulb does a lot. Like if you must have a light outside, having a, a blue light or a red light does, um, does something is better than having the full white light. Um, but there's, there's so many things that are really against insects, which is... Do, do you know of any groups or group that's fighting back against the mosquito squad and the ticks? Mm. It, it's, uh, it, it's tremendously harmful. And I view yeah. that as maybe the number one uh, poison uh, approach. You know, we, we have wood frogs, peepers, mm. neighbors, they spray and they kill them. Yeah, and absolutely. I, I think uh, I, I'd love to connect with someone and, and really start to fight back on that misconception. Yeah, I, I would look towards the Xerxes Society. They're the, the Xerxes Society is like the society on arthropod protection. Um, and they have the, the best resources around. Um, they, there is like a main pollinator Xerxes Society person. Um, besides that, it's, it's so hard because even when like we main passed like a pesticide law but there's so many loopholes around it and there's nobody actually checking in to make sure people are using best practices or anything like that so i think a lot of it does come down to, to education and, and bringing the word out um, it's unfortunate but like ticks ticks are a big one that people are spraying for the sprays don't work on ticks also um, and they kill everything else um, and they kill anything that would be predators of these species and and it's really really complicated and my hope is just that that we can keep spreading the word and educating people that this stuff doesn't work and creating biodiversity does work yeah all right so we are digging up our driveway um, and, and we have this, I don't know, 10 by 30 foot area that is kind of like a, a blank space. So what would you, like just in your perfect dream? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to throw, throw back, back a question, question to you. Uh, what kind of soil do you have and what kind of sun do you have? Because a lot of a lot of what to plant comes down to uh, what we call right plant, right place. So rather than amending your soil and changing your soil, finding a plant that fits in those spaces yeah. that will provide habitat, um, which is going to be something that is way easier and doesn't take years of trying to change your soil and your soil is just always going back to, to what it was. It wants to say what it is, but there's always something to fill in an area. So even I get a lot of questions about like, my yard is basically a gravel pit. What do I do? How do I turn it into soil? Um, and there's things that we can plant that, that do really well. Um, a lot of things like uh, dry, dry gravel loving species and there's uh, nitrogen fixers like sweet fern does really well um, it's a really cool plant that will spread and can, can grow in a lot of areas if you check out the planting for climate resilience there's a lot of great species that that fit those kind of roles um, but really we've got the the trees the ground covers and the shrubs and compiled with those those books um, everything's kind of separated in a, a habitat type thing so like soil it, it talks about what types of soil these plants need, what types of sun these plants need, and then the climate one, we added a new segment about whether or not they can handle salt tolerance and drought tolerance and things like that. So we're adding those on to um, our website also. Um, even if you don't wanna buy our seed, if you look at our seed sale page, you can filter for different um, site conditions and get lists of plants that work really well for that. Mm -hmm. We have what's called a comprehensive plant list. It's not fully comprehensive, but it's a long plant list that's all also separated by um, the type of soil or sun that you have, which 
I could just start naming plants, but we'll be here forever. <laughs> Yeah, good question. Um, so the question is about uh, when to remove the leaves, if you should remove the leaves. Uh, I leave the leaves forever. Um, they will break down. Oaks break down the slowest. Um, so that's, that's a big argument that people give me. Um, but they provide really, really great insulation. And they become basically mulch. Uh, so I don't mulch. Um, I did my fellowship at the Mount Cuba Center, which is a native plant botanical garden. And a lot of what they use for mulch is just leaf piles. Um, they keep a big pile of leaves. You need more than what you would for regular mulch. Um, but, but they do a really good job. And I find most plants can push right through the leaves and be fine. It actually often makes them a little bit stronger, it makes their, their stems a little bit stronger. If you have a plant that you know struggles with that sort of thing, you can kind of like push them aside and, and open it up for the plant. Um, some areas of my yard get gets like more leaves than I want in one spot. So I, I try to like rake it into a corner. And then I, I literally pick up piles of leaves and put them around my plants. Every time I do a new planting, I put leaves around the planting and around the plants there. And it provides a lot of moisture holding. And it um, helps suppress any weeds that would come up. It really helps insulate that plant in a really good way. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Go ahead. Um, so I'm sure you get this question all the time, but I feel like it's a really interesting and ongoing conversation around um, grass alternatives for lawns that have like kids or like that actually use lawns as like a play surface. Mm -hmm. um, and I have not, I, I know there's like Pennsylvania sedge and then some folks like clover, but is there anything you would recommend that has that kind of durability for like a lot of the traffic? Yeah, uh, I have several. And I would suggest, so a study a couple years ago came out. Uh, Mount Cuba did a study on lawn alternatives. That's pretty good. And then um, the Cornell came out with a pretty cool, mm -hmm. their botanical garden did a, a study on, on lawn alternatives. Those are, are grasses, um, okay. which like only support so much. My big thing that I love right now is yarrow. Um, oh. It can be mowed. It will flower when it's mowed. Uh, it can handle so many things. Um, I'm working on right now coming out with some sort of seed mix that can be um, a few different species that can be mowed. So things like strawberry, things like pussy toes, um, things like flax leaf aster, um, yarrow are all ones that like can be mowed, don't get more than that tall and can still yeah. flower and things like that. Um, yeah, and then of course violets. Violets oh, are great. Okay. We love violets. <laughs> That's great, thank you. Yeah, great question. Cool. Anything else? Yeah. So in the corner of my yard, I just have a place I leave wild. I have steam nettles that came. Wonderful. I have goldenrod that came on its own. I have asters. I mean, sometimes all you have to do is leave it. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what I was saying earlier. Is sometimes you get lucky. At, like the, So one of the really magical things about our world is the seed bank. Um, it's called the living seed bank. You know, we say seed bank and we think about like Norway and them saving vegetable seeds for a million years. Who knows if they're going to germinate when you need to when you need them and like everything collapses or whatever. Um, but there are so many seeds, billions and billions of seeds in our soil um, just waiting and they're dormant and they're just waiting for the right conditions to, to grow. Um, and sometimes that's a disturbance. Sometimes that's not a disturbance. Sometimes that's just letting things come up. Um, and there's, it's really, really magical. And sometimes it takes many years. Like my yard, there's parts, same thing. Like the, the early ones came up. I had a couple early goldenrods and asters come up. And then like a couple years ago, or last year, um, Pearly Everlasting showed up. Um, just must have been the right conditions. I pulled up um, a couple invasive species. and. Poof, they came up. Um, so, so it really, it's amazing what, what
can be already in your soil that you just don't know about until you give it a chance. It's so true. It's great. And stinging nettle is great. People don't like stinging nettle, but it's actually really amazing. It's great for, for people, like you can eat it, um, but it's also host plant to some really cool caterpillars. So it's a neat one. Yeah. Blue stem, like <coughs> little blue stem? Yeah. Oh, you've opened up a, a hole here. Uh, little blue stem is my favorite grass. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'm going to rant for a minute. Uh, so if any of you came to my four season walks last year, <laughs> um, there's, there's some really beautiful little blue stem uh, grasslands in Maine, and they are rapidly disappearing. Um, little blue stem grasslands are kind of sand plain glass grasslands. It's where you'd find um, pitch pine and, and blueberry barren type habitats. Um, and they're, they're considered what's called S1 critically endangered in the state of Maine. Um, so the S rankings are kind of like division rankings in sports and colleges. D1's the top, right? So S1 is, is a critically endangered habitat. Um, they're warming more rapid than any other terrestrial areas on our, in, in the state of Maine. Um, and a lot of the issues with them disappearing come from fire suppression, so lack of management. Um, colonization came in and we suppressed fires. Um, indigenous people for millennia and lightning for millennia was creating fires that were disturbing areas and creating these sand plain grasslands. Um, and then we said no more fires. <laughs> um, and with that, lost all of our fire dependent species. Um, uh, Leatris blazing star is an endangered species in the state. Uh, our sundial lupin, there is a native lupin to the state that is considered extinct from the state um, because of that, because of the lack of, of fire in our state. Um, yeah, the lupins that you see around here are not native. They're an invasive species. It sucks, but it's true. <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, I love little blue stem. It's also one of the few grasses that supports like 30 different caterpillars. So a lot of things can feed on it. It provides really great habitat. It's a warm season grass, so it comes up a little bit later, but it is spectacularly beautiful. It's got all these blues and purples, and then when it goes to seed, it just creates this beautiful habitat. Um, and that would be a really also good one for your gravelly side driveway. Um, it's super salt tolerant. I have it all along my roadside. Um, it can handle salting, it can handle plowing, it, it does great. And it's just really, really gorgeous. It tends to hold its seeds for a really long time. Um, yeah, it's... Is it a spreader? It'll, yeah, it'll spread by seed and it'll spread a little bit by root, but mostly by seed. Um, but but it, it'll spread nicely. Um, Mine just showed up. I live like across the streets from a, a sand plain grassland. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm turning into my, my front yard into that um, mm -hmm. to, try to try to keep it going. Um, and those ones were one of the first things to come up when I moved in and stopped having mowing happen and started mm -hmm. yanking things <laughs> that I didn't want there. It's really, really neat. My little blue, uh, my low bush blueberries are really thriving right now, which is mm -hmm. exciting, yeah. Great question. <laughs> I could talk about little blue stem for forever. <laughs> right, how'd you know? <laughs> it's funny, it's, it's also like now some of the only places you can find that species are not in its normal habitat, they're on roadsides. So as you're like driving down the road and you see that beautiful blue fall grass, um, a lot of that is little blue stem and it's just because it gets mowed enough and, and beaten up enough by our plows that that's like kind of the places it still exists. It's funny. Yeah. Can I ask another question about I'd love to plant um, like singing nettle and bee balm and, and blueberry and even yarrow which are like medicinal, medicinal and edible plants but I think there's probably lead in my soil and I know you can do things like that sunflower seed or like other plants that can help clean that soil but you know what, what would you say to yeah. things like that yeah that's a lot a lot trickier of an answer and you may have gotten a, a stumper for me <laughs> It's really hard. There's there's certain things that are really good at removing heavy metal, metals. I was just was just talking to somebody raving about like pill bugs, like uh, wood louse and things like that. Or actually, like don't kill them when you see them. They're really good at. at taking up heavy metals from an area um, and when they die they don't release them back in they have some mechanism where they're able to kind of convert it to something else um, so 
I don't have a good answer. I, I would be hesitant about eating or using anything out of like a lead contaminated area. Um, lead's pretty, really toxic. Um, you could do planters, that is an option. Um, a lot of those species do grow fine in planters. I have a lobish blueberry sitting in a pot that's happy as can be. Um, so I would try that. Yeah, like, like I've heard, I mean, there's lead plant, which is a, supposed to do that. That's why it's called lead plant. Um, but I'd have to do some, some research otherwise. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one. And we're finding more and more contaminated soils <laughs> around. It's, it's, it's rough. Um, hopefully, um, plants as they grow in an area and, and like return some of the natural soil, it will help um, push some of that down at least. But yeah, we don't really know at this point. Um, but I'm sure there's a list somewhere of, of good native plants that can, can help with that. Yeah, lead plants the top of my mind, but it's a neat plant. Cool. Any other questions? Well, if no one has any Thank questions, you. I just need to give a plug. Yes, we want you all to join Wild Seed Project, but we do have all of these yes. lovely pamphlets mm. and books in the library that you can check out right here at South Portland Public Library. Um, also, I have been very remiss and I have not thanked our South Portland Community Access TV crew who has filmed this so that all of you are going to be able to go either on their channel or on our website um, or the sustainability website um, and be able to rewatch this. Because I know so many people were taking notes, but sometimes in taking notes you miss things. Um, and Emily was so gracious to allow us to film it um, and let your, all your neighbors know, um, because I'm sure there are others who are interested in the same thing who are not here. And then I want to give a plug to Turkey Hill Farm, mm -hmm. which is in Cape Elizabeth, and which, which is where Emily is all so the I time. Why there's dirt all over my face? <laughs> <laughs> I changed my clothes but didn't wash my face. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and she is always looking for people to help out yes. over there. I, I had the pleasure of doing that and, um, and wandered also into a bird walk that she did <laughs> mm -hmm. on the property in April, and it was amazing. Um, but you, I don't know quite how people sign up for that. So uh, you wanna check out our website. Um, there's a, a volunteer form that you can fill out and it'll get you on our list to get all the notifications when we're doing volunteer things um, and events. We have them most Wednesdays, but occasional other days. Um, we're planning on trying to do a weekend one soon so that people that work and have jobs can, can also come, come help us. But always lots of heavy lifting <laughs> and things like that to do if you're willing. But we're always down to find something else too because there's also a lot of like label writing and things like that if you're not so into heavy lifting. Um, we're dividing thousands of plants, <laughs> lots and lots to do and we're um, smothering a lot of grass. So, so what we're doing is building up um, basically a seed nursery. So just to provide more seed availability to people that's locally grown, um, we're planting as many species as we provide on our seed sale as we can on this property to be able to collect even more um, to have it available for people to, to grow their, their plants from seed. And it is very close. It's in Cape Elizabeth. Yep. There's plenty of parking. Yep. Um, so, and it's really very fun. Yeah, and even if you're fun. going there not for us, go check it out. You're allowed to walk into our fenced area and look at our plants. Uh, it's a really beautiful place. Good bird populations too. Lots of bluebirds. Lots of <laughs> and a lot of different habitats. Yes. I mean, there's the, the kind of the forest. It's a, it's a small property, really. Yeah, it's about 25 <coughs> acres, but it's got forest, it's got a mini wetland, it's got a little grassland type thing. Um, it's a pretty neat, neat spot. So it's really fun. And yes, we would love to have a seed planting workshop in the fall. Um, and we'll, we'll put that out and you can all sign up for it. Um, and thank you again. Yeah. Thank you.